I feel like I lost the opportunity of interacting with uh, Professor Sargent uh, in the past. I wasn't that lucky, like uh, Jesus or, or Albert. But in a way, I feel lately kind of closer to him because uh, we hired a very good student of Tom Sargent coming out of the NYU last year. So I'm learning a lot from a student of Tom Sargent about how Tom Sargent is thinking about economics. So I guess this is not the ideal world, but uh, at least it's working for me. So we, we, we have, we've been here many good things in this, uh, in this presentation. So, uh, so Professor Sargent started uh, being apologetic about not using equations. So I think I need to apologize because I'm going to use some equations in my presentations. Uh, I, I want to start by saying uh, something that Rafa was mentioning too, is uh, about uh, that uh, economics is not about uh, forecasting, it's about understanding. So I, I, I found a good example of that uh, by one of my, of course, favorite uh, economies, one of the greatest scholars in understanding business cycle, how the economy moves around, uh, around, uh, around a trend. And, and it was Robert Lucas. In 2003, he wrote a very interesting article at the American Economic Review called Macroeconomic Priorities. And this, this slide tried to illustrate why he was saying what he was saying there. And, and why it's very important to think about what he was saying as, as what I think is an initial condition. Again, again, I'm bringing an initial condition here as, a, as an extra degree of freedom. It's hard to, as, as Professor Sargent was saying, to think about what's, what's time zero. What time zero for me, for my presentation, will be Lucas 2003. So he was saying macroeconomy was born as a distinct field in the 40s uh, as, a, as a way, as an intellectual response to the Great Depression. That's a great, that's a great quote. A, that's, so the Great Depression forced people to think hard about, about business cycle. I'm gonna get back to the Great Depression later. But at the same time, he was saying, in this, in this lecture, what he was writing at that time is a macroeconomy, uh, in, this, in this sense of learning, learning how the economy fluctuates, has, has succeeded. It's the central problem of depression and prevention has been solved for all practical purposes and has in fact, been solved for many decades. And that was written in 2003. So he, he wrote that by, by thinking in these two, this, that's a simplification that central banks uh, usually do. It's probably wrong, but it's gonna be helpful for what I'm gonna say later. So we have uh, the, the, the volatility, the, the change in the GDP in the United States in this panel. And this is uh, inflation and inflation expectations, different sample periods for, for the reason I'm gonna say now. So they started in the 50s. So you see that when Professor Lucas was saying what he was saying, so this is what was called the great moderation. So the volatility of the output in, in the United States dropped dramatically for what the volatility was in the past decades. And at the same time, inflation was coming down dramatically and inflation expectations were kind of relatively stable, especially in the first uh, half of the, of the last decade. So it was making a lot of sense what he was saying at that time. So what happened is that, well, in the background, there was, as Albert was describing, there was this uh, housing bubble in the United States, like in other countries. So here's a, a, a plot of what happened. This, this is uh, the evolution of uh, personal income in the United States, which is the real, uh, the red line. And the blue line is what's happened with the uh, house prices in the United States, as you see, in 2007, starting a little bit before in 2006, there was a huge collapse in the evolution of the housing price. This is a result of uh, some sort of a <clears throat> coordination in the expectation, such a way that people start believing that there's uh, some profits uh, related to the getting into that market. Of course, that creates something that's like a banking crisis. That here, I'm gonna go back to the Great Depression. This, this figure is, it's what, uh, what is uh, what's happened with the, with the banking sector. There was a collapse of financial intermediation. And, and uh, the way you think about collapsing the financial intermediation is that they, they think about what's happened in, the, in, the, in, the, in 29 and in the 30s in the US. So, and this brings me to another uh, great quotation from, from um, Professor Sargent's presentation, uh, paraphrasing uh, Steeler. He's like, 
crises are bringing new issues or not. This is pretty similar if you read history. Or if you read books of the 30s, uh, you, read, you read the history of what happened in the 30s in the United States. It has a lot of similarities to what, what's been going on in the, in the United States and other countries right now. So here you see in, the, in, this, uh, in this figure the banking failure in the United States. And you see a huge amount of bank failures associated with the Great Depression. And this is the banking failures that happen in now. So, it, so the mountain is kind of not very big relative to what was going on. But if you look at in terms of total asset and total deposits of this banking failure now, as uh, what was happening in the Great Depression, so the size of this, what the economy is called shock, of the size of what was going on in the economy now after this uh, big uh, uh, recession, is, is, it, was, uh, it was clearly a few order of magnitude to what was going on uh, in, in the Great Depression. That's very important for thinking about uh, policies down the road and for thinking about how do we need to think about models and, and, and policies. So of course, because of this banking crisis, financial condition tight, a lending condition of course. So there's another plot that probably many of you have been uh, uh, seeing uh, lately. So this, this uh, is just a survey that is conducted at the, at the Federal Reserve Board and it shows you what happened with the demand and the supply of credit in the United States. So you see that during this Great Depression period, Great Recession period, there's a, a fall in the demand for credit, and at the same time, uh, financial institutions were tightening because the standard for getting a loan were a lot higher than, than in the past. And what's happened with corporate, corporate spread of with credit, of with borrowing in the economy, what they went to the roof. So, the, so when, when a firm tried to even bypass uh, financial institution and try to use uh, capital markets to issue debt, the conditions were a lot tighter than, than before. And those are, those are, by all means, incredibly high spread, so the amount of risk in the economy increased dramatically. And this is some of the theme that uh, Professor Sajjan has been trying to study and try to understand uh, in many papers. So what's happened as a result is this is uh, there is a collapse in, in, in activity in, in the U.S. But given the size of the, of the shock that we've seen in the last uh, few, days, few years in the United States, you see here the evolution of the GDP growth in the United States back to the 19th century. And you see the Great Depression in which output was falling almost 30%. Of course, something happened after that, as you see the huge rebound. And so that's, that's give you a, a, a fantastic laboratory to think about uh, policies and to think about how agents form expectation. And you see that now, given the size of the shock, GDP was not that dramatic fall, but it was, after the World War II, a significant drop in activity, closer to 10%. That's, as Jesus was describing, translated into unemployment. Now, what's happening with prices? And that, that's going to be useful for thinking about policies. Well, but prices, you see, this is normalizing in the, of the peak of the, of the expansion. And the blue line is what's happening with prices after the Great Depression. You see prices falling. It means deflation. So price fall in three years, 25%. So something that was 100% uh, value in 29, in 33 was only 35% of that value. And what's happened in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in the current situation, which is the yellow line, well, prices, prices move, but by all means, there was not such a deflationary problem. So that that's tells you something about, about, about policies, about how important it is to think about these, 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 uh, these facts and in, in thinking about policies implemented in the United States and what kind of models are useful to, to explain why given the shock in, in financial intermediation didn't translate into activity and, and inflation in the way we saw in the, in the 30s. Okay, of course, coming from a central bank, I need to talk about policy instruments. And here's something that you probably have seen many times. So this panel shows the interest rate. Of course, after this, this is the interest rate starting in 88. So you see that because of this dramatic fall in activity and, and the worries about prices falling, uh, the central bank would like to move the interest rate, which is the basic instrument that uh, we use to affect prices and output in the economy, would like to have the interest rate, the nominal interest rate, below zero. Of course, that's really hard. 
it's possible, but, but it requires some institutional arrangement that are uh, probably uh, not very uh, easy to, uh, to implement. So what, what do we do when we would like to uh, have negative interest rate and you can't? So this, this introduces a, a very interesting, uh, what we call non-linearity in our way of thinking about uh, monetary policy. And, and at the same time, we, we were not paying attention to uh, the demand for deposit of financial institution uh, uh, that having the central bank. So here in this plot we have the evolution of the uh, excess reserve, so the amount of uh, reserve that the uh, financial institution are now holding at the central bank, at the Fed, and the red line is inflation. So you see that during the recession, this, this dash uh, area here, <coughs> so inflation was trying to see some symptom of, uh, of, of deflation, and at the same time we rise uh, the balance sheet uh, of the Fed by, by more than a trillion dollar. And immediately you see a rebound in, in, in inflation. So that that's, that's tells you something about how to think in, in, in terms of, of policies. It's, it's, not, it's not easy, but, uh, but that that's tells you something about what we have learned uh, about, about uh, some of the, the mistakes that were made in the in the 30s. Okay, so with all this background, what I'm trying to spend some time is, with, uh, coming back to, to Lucas, probably 2007 and 2009 introduced a new challenges in trying to integrate business cycle, asset pricing, and financial intermediation. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's something that's gonna be with us, uh, and has been with us for a long time. So, uh, so this is something that probably economists forgot but uh, now this crisis just bringing back to our way of, of thinking about how to model that. So Rafa asked me to think about why, why, why this is important on, on, on how uh, people that work at the Federal Reserve, especially in, in the group that I have touched to, that basically try to think in terms of models, uh, try to deal with all these complicated uh, uh, problems. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about how, how do you think about financial frictions as a way of thinking uh, about the persisting and the amplification of fluctuations in the economy. How, how that, uh, there, there are different ways of thinking about that. So there's, there's many shortcuts that have uh, 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 been taken in the literature. So thinking about this, this, this is just something that happened and it's something that I don't know, I don't understand. It's kind of a, the shocks of a exogenous approach. It's completely out of the model. Or thinking about, well, there's something in, the, in my model that needs to be building. I think so thinking endogenous propagation of this kind of uh, collapsing financial intermediation and how this translates into activity and, and prices. But I, I'm gonna spend you know, most of my time thinking about challenges of monetary policy and not just that, that, that we need something new. It's just how to use the tools that we have to understand the challenges in terms of the this, this, this non-linearity introduced by the zero lower bound, that the, the willingness of the central bank to uh, affect the economy even if the normal interest rate is stuck at zero. And there's many contribution in that literature. That, that, that new model that we have, bringing some sort of new uh, uh, interesting uh, way of making commitment by a central bank that, is, that are not attached to the usual way of thinking about commitment coming from the Barrow Gordon, but trying to, uh, this is boot for this professor at Columbia now that tried to, uh, to exploit uh, expectation, future expectation to uh, improve outcomes uh, today. Okay, so I'm not gonna make it, I have a lot of stuff here to do in 10 minutes, so. Uh, and then I wanna try to talk a little bit about the, the, how important is the size and the composition of the balance sheet. Uh, this is coming back to uh, this beautiful paper by uh, Neil Wallace. This is the, the idea of, uh, of how relevant is the composition of the assets uh, of, the, of the balance sheet of, uh, of the Fed in, in affecting a relative price of assets in the economy and so uh, output and, and, and prices. And, and of course this opened a bunch of interesting uh, 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 issues that uh, are related with uh, how do you think in terms of uh, these big shocks and, and usually the tools that, that, that we use to uh, to understand policy and to understand business cycle are looking at the small fluctuations of the output and, and prices around a uh, uh, medium and long run path and how these change uh, our way of, of thinking about uh, solving models beyond these, these simple linear approximations. So those are some of the issues that 
uh, uh, we all have been working in the, in the, last, uh, in the last years and are very relevant for policy now. Okay, so I have some, some, some basic three equations here. One is about uh, asset pricing and, and, and how you think in terms of, uh, of, 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 of assets in the economy and how you think in terms of uh, output and, 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 and interest rates. So, so the basic valuation equation that, that is, is probably one of the, the most beautiful uh, equations you can think of is just tell you that the price of any assets is just a payoff X that is discounted. That is discounted by something that we call here M is what Professor Sajjan would say is a stochastic discount factor. And that makes a huge difference uh, uh, between economies and, and, and accountants or even actuarial. So the discount factor is, is try to capture this idea of that you discount subject to risk in the economy. And you, the way you think about this uh, risk is by thinking about how do you change consumption between today and tomorrow. And this is what you have here. Uh, so so, uh, so this, this simple equation that tells you uh, uh, how you value asset is one of the key equations that uh, people like Mike Woodford uh, use to think about once you have, uh, 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 take, you, you take into account the, the, the aggregate research constraint in the economy to link in output, which is what I call here YT, and, and, and expected future real interest rate, which is what I call here R and, and, and pi t plus one. So what this equation is telling you is that uh, thinking about output today is just thinking about what's gonna happen with interest rate, not with, with short-term interest rate today, but what the expected future value of inflation and, 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 and interest rate uh, uh, is, is going to be uh, 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 Said so, the central bank has some some power to manipulate uh, expected inflation or not, or have some power to manipulate expected uh, future short rate. If this is the case, then this this simple model will tell you something about what's happening with outcome today, what happened with output today. So so that's imposed some 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 interesting uh, dynamic uh, uh, constraint in the economy. Of course, underlying this. This, this, there's, a, there's a, an, an equilibrium real rate that depends on something that you hear a lot in, 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 the, in the news too. So the real rate without any kind of friction in the economy can be attached to growth or to uh, uncertainty, to the volatility of the, of, the, of, the, of the output in the economy. So if, if growth is, is low, the real rate is gonna go down, or if people are really, uh, taking action uh, as a way of insurance against uh, bad, bad situation, so because of the risk of the volatility of the economy is really high, then the real rate is gonna go down too. So a situation in which you know, growth is low, uncertainty is high, push the real rate down, the interest rate that, that the ECB, that, sorry, not the ECB, the, 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 the Fed try to, uh, try to approximate is, is going negative and there are different ways of getting to that but are gonna be affected by the fact that the nominal interest rate cannot go below zero, even if the real rate can. Yeah. Okay, so there's a risk. I don't have time for explaining that. Uh, I don't have time for explaining that. I'm not gonna get into this. I'm gonna get into that because there's another interesting piece here. So that's the, 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 the piece of output. Oh, this is a piece of inflation. So a way of thinking about inflation, about pricing the economy is to say, firm set price looking at future marginal costs and that tells you that inflation today depends not just on today's output. It depends on today's output given expected inflation. And that's very important because it tells you that if you want to change inflation today, you really want to affect not just output today, but output in the future. So you, you get this interesting loop of expectation, future decision of uh, 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 the central bank about interest rate matter for uh, output today, and output today and output tomorrow matter for inflation today. And this is the kind of uh, a model that you, you can use to think about some of the limits imposed uh, to the evolution of the nominal interest rate uh, in an economy. A, a simple way of describing this, this model is by using something that closes it. So we have two equations, one for output and one for inflation, and the third equation is gonna be used to say something about how the central bank set the nominal interest rate. Usually it's just a relationship between the outcomes, inflation and output, and the value of the rate. But the zero lower bound imposes a limit here. So it becomes a nonlinear function in, this, in, this, in the context of, uh, of, of, the, of the current situation in the, in, the, in the United States and in Europe too. I have some, some staff here that, so, so this is just to give you an example of how 
how do we think in those, in those terms? So this graph plots something that we do, uh, we do at, the, uh, at the Fed. So it tells you different path for the nominal interest rate and different path for uh, unemployment and for inflation. Thinking in, in the terms that I described, this very simple toy model that has a lot of uh, uh, expectation built in. So there are three lines here, the red and the blue and the green. And those lines are lines that uh, uh, are uh, uh, linked to different way of setting interest rate. So the red line is a way of thinking about setting interest rate without paying much attention to what's happened to unemployment. I'm thinking more about what's happened to inflation. So if you look at that sort of rule that tells you that you want to start increasing interest rate very soon, very, very soon. And the result is that unemployment is going to stay high for relatively uh, long time. And inflation, of course, is going to be subdued for, uh, for, for, for a little while, too. So if you start promising keeping the interest rate low for longer, like what we call here a balance approach, a balance approach is you're thinking more about the dual mandate that the Federal Reserve have, and to think about the situation in, in terms of of the labor market. So you start thinking better outcome because you're making promises that translate into a lower unemployment and a little bit higher inflation. But that's still not the optimal policy, which you can you think about uh, in terms of, uh, of the model that I described. So you can even make even farther promises, keeping the interest rate even, even lower for longer. And that's going to improve your outcomes. It's going to improve your outcome because it's going to make unemployment getting closer to to the initial employment level before the crisis. And as a result, you try to you would increase inflation for a long time above something that is close to 2%, which is uh, what, what, what people tend to believe is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is a good approximation for price stability in the economy. This is just an example of how the tools that uh, Professor Sargent and, and Albert and, and Jesus were describing before in thinking about uh, how, how, how you can think of monetary policy. So just to, uh, just, to, uh, just to finish, of course, it's open many issues, but I want to just finish with, with, this, with this remark. So there's a wonderful interview that the Professor Sajan gave to uh, the region uh, in Minneapolis. And in, in, that, in that interview that I recommended to everyone, he said, in our dynamic and uncertain world, our belief about what other people and institutions will do play big roles in shaping our behavior. So try to incorporate these into these simple models it, it, will, it will be part of, uh, of, of our uh, uh, research in, in many departments out of the Fed in the, in the next few years. So I'm glad that I can read this kind of sentence because are pretty motivating for what we're doing at the Fed. Thank you.